uh, let me show you another one. IB University today would like to share about our global engagements, including maintaining internationalization implementation amidst this pandemic. We will dive into many uh, major agendas we are focusing, such as international seminar, summer course, and joint lectures, uh, and all we, we have done virtually. We are happy, we are very, very happy to hear insight from Tokyo Nodai and Anyu, as Australian National University, and far ranging topics. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, uh, through the international research, IOB University become more visible globally. It can be seen from the QS World University ranking by subject agriculture and forestry, where IOB ranking has significantly increased since uh, 2000. We have uh, our rank is uh, 200 uh, something. Now in the 2020, our rank is in uh, 59. So we are included in the top uh, 100 uh, best university in agriculture and forestry. In Asia, IBB is grouped into top 10 for agriculture and forestry. Uh, your subjects also have emerged for life science and environmental science in the top 500 world ranking. Research and publication is one of the important indicators to measure the, in the performance. And of course, we are glad that IBB was especially mentioned during the launch, the THE Impact, THE, Time Higher Education Impact, by Time Higher Education's uh, World University Ranking, to progress well on some SDGs, particularly SDG 2, Zero Hunger. We are in the number of 11, rank, rank 11 globally. And under this ranking system, AB is comprehensively placed in the 77th position, World University ranking for all 17 SDGs. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, I would like to uh, welcome all of you in this uh, very, very fruitful webinar to share idea, to share uh, experience regarding how to deal with the pandemic uh, COVID. From now, I would like to invite Prof. Dodik. Vice Director for Collaboration Information System to present more technical details about our topic, impact of internationalization policy on global engagement. We hope that ANU and uh, NODE and Kasus University and other our international partners, uh, we are uh, necessary to, to strengthen our collaborations. And I think by Everything's doing by uh, done by virtual uh, system. Everything can be done more uh, easier, easier and more efficient. And I think uh, we can uh, do more to uh, to <coughs> to strengthen our collaborations. And I think, uh, especially with No Day, uh, I was invited to to have speech in April, and because of pandemic COVID nineteen, and then there's uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, this event was postponed into uh, next year. We hope the cooperation with Node and ANU can be strengthened, and as well as with the Kasasa University. Thank you. Hopefully, we will have fruitful discussion or even potential collaborations together. Uh, please, Pak Dodi, Vice Director for Collaboration and Information Systems, to uh, present more technical details about our topics. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Arif Satya. Now it's the time uh, uh, for the first presentation. We will be live by Professor Dodi Rido Nurahmat. Professor Dodi Rido Nurahmat uh, is the Vice Rector and in Information System of IPB University. He will deliver the presentation entitled Impact of International uh, Internationalization Policy on Global Engagement. Professor Dodi uh, was uh, graduated from uh, Göttingen University, Germany, uh, both master and uh, doctoral in uh, uh, forestry policy. So uh, without further ado, uh, the stage is your uh, Professor Dodi, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gacha Gunaivi. Uh, please, uh, admin, uh, open the uh, share screen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, thank everyone involved in today, today's University Network uh, webinar. This is absolute honor for me on behalf of IPB University today to have you all, especially the esteemed speakers from Tokyo University of Agriculture and Australian National uh, University. Uh, our two dear partners, 
although virtually I wish uh, we can learn together from each other about these two very important elements in higher education systems, internationalization and collaboration. Collabor collaboration. Uh, next, I, I didn't uh, uh, screen from my uh, laptop. Next, please. Huh? No. Okay. Okay, before we dive in, I would like to bring up the latest policy by our ministry on Campus Merdeka. Campus Merdeka means uh, uh, free campus or independent campus yeah uh, independent learning for universities yeah which as well as experiences is significantly derived in uh, a way or another by covid-19 pandemic where we are pushed to conduct almost everything online including internationalization after talk a bit uh, deeper on uh, global engagement development by IPB University, including with uh, four top institutions whom we collaborate in today's webinar. I will uh, title, uh, I will uh, little mention about uh, how we can conduct a creative and progressive internationalization from home as a result of a current pandemic. By uh, Okay, uh, back to my uh, first point about independent learning policy, Ministry of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia recently launched a breakthrough uh, step towards uh, more uh, fluid learning. We see this uh, as a golden opportunity to realize a more inclusive education nationally, even globally with less borders. This is the moment when our internationalization element as higher education institution can strive way more. Next, yeah. We believe internationalization become important as it develops global ready mindset for our academia. Borderless exchange can be done through mobility, curriculum, and partnership. Next. And these are some of our major programs in conducting internationalization. We offer international class for undergraduate full degree and exchange program, dual degrees, international seminars, and summer courses equipped with uh, foreign language courses and public lectures with foreign professors and speakers. In spite of all that, we must consider that uh, a fact that out of more than uh, 29,000 of IPB students, only 2% are international and 4% have experienced in uh, some sort of international programs. This source issue of internationalization exclusively still uh, lingering with our system. So we must push more IPB academia to be involved and promote not exclusivity, but inclusivity. First, Tokyo no Dai. We connect by holding special master program, open call and international students summit together, although this year 2020 with IB University as a host. We must postpone to next year. Today, we will listen Professor Hatanaka and Assistant Professor Ramadona for a deeper insights in our research collaboration so far. Next, Australian National University. Although uh, we are still in process of analyzing MOU together, we are happy to have already our academia to be selected in first ever bets of future research talent, or we call it FRTI Awards, Indonesia uh, this year. FRTI Awards selects uh, highly competent applicants from totally uh, 30 top higher institutions 
in Indonesia who nominated many applicants each and finally select only five lectures and five students to be fully funded conducting research for three months in, Asia, uh, in Australian National University, the number one university in Australia. Our vocational school lecturer, Mrs. Vega, is uh, humbled to be accepted and hosted by Dr. Will Grant from NU, uh, but due to a pandemic, had to postpone to next year uh, in mind. We do hope for good luck for her. Thank you for, very much for the uh, opportunity uh, from the NU for our IPB uh, staff uh, to uh, make exchange program there. Furthermore, Kassasiat University, as uh, our fellow uh, Thai Neck Board, we are happy to have a President uh, Chong Rak Wat Srin Rap visiting uh, us last year for MOU signing. In terms of uh, students' mobility, we have so many every year, ones of which include what, uh, what uh, we present in uh, the slides through AIMS or ASEAN Internationality, International Mobility for a Students Program, we send uh, six students for one semester. Through uh, KU summer course, we send four students for two weeks and other four students for KU International Exchange for also one semester. And uh, this year we have uh, also a, a joint summer course program with the uh, Kassasat University in terms of a joint collaboration between uh, uh, Rector Council of Indone Indonesian Rector's Council and the Thailand Rector Council. Uh, so we call it uh, MRPDN. Uh, perhaps uh, the summer course will be held on uh, the early, September, early November uh, this year. Last but definitely not least, uh, with our dear partners from Siarka, our students and alumni receive financial uh, assistance each year. The most recent one is through National Taiwan University Master's Joint Scholarship with Siarka. Our alumnus Ilham is accepted among total three grantees. Our international graduate uh, students from KNB program, KNB is Kemitraan Negara Berkembang, is uh, Indonesian uh, scholarship for uh, developing uh, country partners. Yeah, names uh, Mola and Dol from Ethiopia and Sherif from Nigeria. Sherif is my uh, student yeah, under my supervision. Last year, we granted funding. They all have finished uh, their study in IPB University. Big thanks to Sharka and to all our collaborators for your uh, far ranging support. We can better ourselves together as a global uh, partners. All about international collaboration that I have elaborated relates back to the solution of the internationalization exclusively issue that uh, we talked about uh, previously. As can be seen in this World University Ranking System, we still have a lot to do. But each year, especially in past few years, with us working hard on promoting more global engagement, we are very thankful for findings, some developments as a result. Through teamwork of our nine faculties and uh, three schools on uh, boosting up internationalization, these are latest standings of IBB University in QS, Times Higher Education and Times Higher, higher Education Impact. Yeah, Times Higher Education Impact where we are a top ranking in 10 SDGs pillars, national ranking and UE, University of Indonesia Green Metric Ranking, where we will elaborate more in detail in next slides. In the past six years, thanks to great trust from our partners, we have seen increase in our QS ranking in both world and ASEAN region. Together with Kassetsiat University, we are named in top 
10 of QS Asia ranking by agriculture and forestry subject. Recently, we are named in the top ranks for two other subjects, namely environmental science and biological sciences. Still in regards to sustainability and environmental friendly practices, UI Green Metrics named IBB University number 40 in the world and second of national uh, wide. As much as uh, are grateful for these developments, we have been truly uh, saddened by the still ongoing pandemic that affects everyone, including us, big time. Just like uh, other institutions, we act quickly on handling these worldwide issues. Uh, I myself is the, the leader of the crisis centers of COVID-19 of IBB University. Yeah, and uh, comprised of uh, many related experts, uh, we fabricated five activity uh, basis as strategic measures in facing this pandemic. We see uh, this as a wake up call where everyone is required to be more creative in order to maintain internationalization implementation, but we, but uh, by always prioritizing uh, health uh, protocol and uh, well-being of every stakeholders to bring us to solution of internationalization at home. These are several programs that we choose to promote, to keep the international exposure going as mentioned before. As part of internationalization at home, we keep going and organizing many interesting and progressive agendas that you might be interested. One of uh, which is international seminar, workshop and symposium. During this webinar, I would like to warmly invite you to participate in any of the presented events with broad array of field of expertise. This year we have in uh, uh, we have a one in uh, the July yeah in this month and uh, one international conference in August and uh, five uh, international conference in September as well as five others in November. So. Uh, Totally, we have about uh, 15, yeah? 15, 15 international conference yeah? Yeah. in this year. Yeah, uh, totally, we have uh, about 15 international conference in this year uh, conducted uh, by IBB University. And we have also some, uh, yeah, about uh, 20 summer courses yeah, conducted this year by IBB University. And we modified uh, the seminar and uh, international uh, summer courses uh, from offline to online. So uh, we do hope that uh, all of our partners can also participate to our international conference and international uh, summer courses. And uh, these are as well as uh, some of the flyers. And again, for more info, uh, please kindly contact us. This is uh, our international summer courses and international seminar conducted, will be conducted in this year. And lastly, we have as well uh, three joint general lectures this month in form of the IPB talk of complexity and sustainability sciences with speakers uh, focus on three different continents, Africa, North America or USA and uh, South America, yeah. In this case is Argentina. To actualize uh, an effective and efficient internationalization at home, there surely are challenges. All parties must be equipped with uh, decent technology, yeah, recent technology device, internal internet uh, connection, and uh, also platform and uh, good infrastructure. Solid international networking is also a must so that uh, they can engage in activities, even though it is virtual. And on top of all, the hands of experience is lacking nonetheless. But as educator and academia, 
we shall utilize as many opportunities as possible to live up to its potentials. Internationalization at home still can keep the equity of uh, shared contents with much better affordability, cost, and time-wise. It might also reduce uh, carbon footprint, of course, yeah, as less uh, resources are required. So it is environmentally uh, more friendly, I think. To conclude my presentation today, what I want to denote is we all can agree that internationalization at home is essential during the, this pandemic. However, it certainly uh, shall never be a major alternative post-pandemic phase later on, but rather as an additional idea by always abiding the local, national, and global policy in this regard. I conclude internationalization and a global engagement between us should never stop living. We came to the end of my presentation and I have to wrap up this session by once again, expressing my gratitude to you all, partners and attendees. We wish for fruitful discussion and possibly engagement together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for enlightened presentations, Professor Dodi Rido Durohmat. Uh, before uh, we proceed to our second speaker, we have a video showcase from Kasetsat University, Thailand. Uh, please. Uh, uh, Alert from calendar, the 11th Trade Hub Indonesia country meeting. Please, uh, for uh, showing the uh, video from uh, Kasatsat University. Oh. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about how Gesetzad University in Bangkok, Thailand has dealt with coped with the COVID-19 uh, epidemic and how we are engaging in strategic plans of realigning our relationships, rebuilding, rekindling our relationships with our very important partners throughout the world. I'm Professor Matthew Downs. I'm a consultant at the, the university. I've been in Thailand for more than seven years. And the president has asked me to talk a little bit about some of the activities um, uh, as, as I outlined. Uh, very quickly, we, we, we dealt with the crisis the same way that's been done by many, many other par institutions throughout the world in terms of being very concerned about the health um, and medical safety of, of our students and staff and faculty. And so we implemented the, tr the typical requirement of wearing masks and using hand gel throughout the campus and deep cleaning uh, large portions of the campus. Uh, a big part of that, of course, was obviously uh, was also the, the reality that we did cancel online class. Uh, on per in-person classes. We went completely online, so all classes were canceled. Um, and, and indeed, it was difficult for students to participate in lab work or field projects, uh, but with special precautions had to be put in place for those sort of activities outside the norm. With regard to the digital support of teaching and learning, uh, there was a lot of effort made to, to help and train faculty to develop new expertise in dealing with online teaching. And also we had to de deal with the reality that students had different levels of capacity uh, with regarding access to technology. So the university provided free loan of laptop computers in some situations, but also provided um, a very low cost financial assistance and in terms of loans to students so they could procure, procure by the equipment and technology that they needed. Um, so in the so right now, uh, we're on our summer break, uh, and then the fall, the semester coming up, the preference is still going to be online teaching. However, increasingly, we are adopting hybrid or blended learning strategies where some of the classes can be taught um, in person, particularly if there's a significant reason, such as lab work or presenting your thesis uh, or, or field work where, where the students need to be to meet in person. 
we've also been con conscious of trying to provide outreach to internationally. So we have been very active in, in providing um, some online sessions to Coursera that is then that you know, the focus has been more on on the scientific and technology aspects and and how we, we can provide some expertise on these issues for for people outside uh, of, of of our campus. We have tried to maintain some relationships with our international partners because it's that's so important to us. And so last month we had an online dialogue that was specifically focused on our partners. We invited our partners to participate online. And then we had about 40 to 50 partners that participated, over 120 people uh, and that talked about their issues, their concerns, how they coped, what are their dreams, how are their expectations, what can we do to go forward in dealing with the new normal. And indeed, the big focus for us right now is how to cope. We have been, we are obligated, the university is a public university, uh, and we are obligated to, to act in concert with governmental policy. Right now, governmental policy still does not permit um, persons to enter the country other than Thai citizens. So as a consequence, we have no exchange students. We have no foreign visitors uh, coming to our campus. Going forward, we're hoping as soon as possible, the government is talking very seriously about developing a bubble, where a travel bubble, so persons coming from certain countries that have similar, very low incident rates of new COVID uh, uh, infections, like Thailand, that the, under this bubble, there's a potential for students to come, we hope maybe sometime even this coming semester. When we do that, we want to develop protocols that are standardized. We want this protocols for how to deal with incoming students to be based on science and reality. We want to have a dialogue with our partners so that we all are talking and, and requiring the, the same, same degree of caution that would make our students feel comfortable. And also when they travel abroad, we want them to feel welcome. We're talking about developing a, a quarantine cultural learning center. So when students first arrive, if they still need to go into quarantine, we, we will have a capacity for them to part, start being a member of the community uh, and uh, start to participate in the, the academic life and the cultural life of, of being in Thailand. So, so with regard to faculty and student exchange, obviously we're eager to have faculty and students come in person, but even if they cannot come in person, we still think that we can do some things online, such as we want to develop collaborative co-creating classes. In other words, classes that were co-taught, co-created, either for credit or non-credit classes that would make use of the different expertise of us or our partners in, in using faculty from our partners and from our own faculty of developing new courses or new collaboration with, in, in academic uh, uh, part of the programs. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. We think this is a terrific topic and we're, we're glad to hear of information that you gain from, from your seminar. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the video from our close partner, uh, Kasatsat University. Let's uh, continue to the next agenda. Please allow me at uh, this time to read uh, Professor Hatanaka Katsumori and Associate Professor Safil uh, Ramadona bi Biographies. Professor Hatanaka Katsumori is uh, currently a professor at the Department of Agri uh, Agribusiness Management, Faculty of International Agriculture and Food Studies, Tokyo University of Agriculture, Japan. He is uh, head of the Department of Agribusiness Management in the Graduate School of Agriculture, Tokyo University of Agriculture. He completed his PhD degree on the Division of Science and Engineering from Chuo University, Japan in 1993. His research interests uh, at the moment in the area of agriculture, environmental engineering, and also agriculture information engineering. And uh, for Associate Professor uh, Sapio Ramadona, he is also from Tokyo University of Agriculture, Tokyo Nodai, 
He is uh, currently an assistant professor at Department Agribusiness Management, Faculty of International Agriculture and Food Studies, uh, Tokyo University of Agriculture. He, together with his supervisor, successfully created two patents, which are a tool fed co uh, correction device and manufacturing uh, process uh, generation uh, device. So uh, we are warmly inviting Professor Hatanaka for the presentations with the title Collaborative Research Between Indonesia and Tokyo Nodai. Professor uh, Hatanaka, the time is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start the presentation, I need to apologize in advance because I just took a uh, took mistake about misunderstanding about objectives of today's webinar. But uh, I just prepared for my slide for uh, regarding to my research subject. So anyway, I'd like to start my presentation today. Uh, the title of the presentation is Applications for Smart Fishery International Joint Research Project between Indonesia and Japan. And this is collaborative research with Dr. Safir Lamadana of Tokyo University of Agriculture. Uh, the, today's contents of uh, presentations of con contents of presentation is something like this. Uh, the first, I'd like to introduce myself, and also I'd like to introduce my uh, previous uh, research topics regarding to uh, smart uh, smart fishery. Then I'd like to mention about some kind of international collaborative research subject uh, based on ongoing uh, research uh, subject uh, that is called Satraps project. Uh, let me talk about myself first. Uh, my name is Katsumori Hatanaka again, and uh, I was born in 1962, and I've got a PhD from Chuo University, Tokyo, about the computational fluid dynamics. And I've been doing the research about CFD for long years, but uh, after I moved on to Tokai University in 1998, the campus was located in Sapporo, and Sapporo is the capital city of Hokkaido Prefecture, and Hokkaido is the northern territory of Japan. And Hokkaido is very famous among Japanese about agriculture and fishery industries. So since I moved on to Tokai University, I just I was initiated about the uh, ICT applications to, uh, to contribute for the fishery industries and the agricultural sector. By, uh, from that date, I am almost mainly conducting the research regarding to fishery, smart fishery and smart agriculture. And nowadays I'm interested about machine learning too. Uh, let me talk about in the very uh, historical uh, background of the research subject. Uh, the first one is ubiquitous buoy starting from 2003. As you see in this picture, those are very old fashioned, old style of our uh, ubiquitous buoy. But anyway, the first application of ubiquitous buoy was for uh, uh, scallop cultivation. And uh, at the time, we only measured seawater temperatures, but in multi layers. But even so, it is still useful for fishermen to understand the seawater temperatures layers of in, in, under the sea. I think this is the final version of our uh, ubiquitous buoy. As you see in this picture, we have a different uh, types of the uh, ubiquitous buoy. And this is the picture for applications for uh, oyster cultivation in Miyagi Prefecture. It is the northern part of uh, mainland of Japan. And uh, the final version can connect to the many different types of sensors like seawater temperature, chlorophyll, uh, turbidity, DO and so on and so forth. The next uh, <clears throat> example is basimetry. As you see in this picture, uh, Japanese, this is a picture of uh, typical Japanese fishing vessel and many of the Japanese fishing vessel equipped with this kind of uh, equipment that is called plotter. Uh, receiving the GPS and, and showing the lo exact location of the fishing vessel. And many of them are equipped with the fish finder too. And because fish finder can measure the uh, water depths under the fishing vessel, if we combine the water depths and location data that can measure the bottom topography under the sea. And 
So uh, we developed kind of uh, uh, equipment to collect the data from GPS and fish finder, then uh, provide them into the database server through the internet. We can draw kind of, uh, we can conduct kind of a bathymetry automatically. This is one of the example of uh, the data uh, obtained from our system. And this one is drawn by only one uh, information of only one fishing vessel using the uh, previous uh, equipment. And by showing this uh, basimetry result to fishermen, they can they realize that they can collect basimetry data by themselves automatically only by uh, pass away, uh, even though they are doing some of the uh, operations, it can be automatically be taken and it, it must be a very useful. As you know, basimetry is very, very expensive and time consuming in reality. So probably uh, this kind of system can be uh, uh, automatically be done for basimetry. <clears throat> The next uh, example is uh, the resource estimation. As I told you that the, uh, the, we can collect the data of location of fishing vessel. And if we can collect the data of uh, fishing operation information in, uh, sing for single uh, fishing vessels, then maybe it, is it's, it can be uh, useful for information about the resource. Uh, this one is uh, applied to the sea cucumber catch, uh, capture operation. And uh, probably you are not very common about the sea cucumber, is, but sea cucumber is very popular among Chinese and Chinese restaurants. So uh, the market price, especially in Hong Kong, it is very expensive. Japanese sea cucumber is very expensive and many of the fishermen rush into the capture fishery of sea cucumber and that's cause that the risks of over uh, fishing is uh, facing. So we collected the data of fishing operation, operation by each fisherman from, from each fisherman, including the time uh, when they start the operation and when do they finish the operation and total amount of catch. Then by sending these uh, informations and with locations to the database server through internet, we can draw kind of, uh, 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 we can calculate kind of the resource estimation. Uh, the graph on your right here is showing the total amount of catch in 2000, uh, from 2008 and 2010. Actually, our system was applied to the field from 2011 and until then, uh, the total catch amount is decreasing like this and also the calculated estimated resource of sea cucumber also in decline like this. So that, that's, that is nothing but the overfishing. However, by uh, introducing our system to the field and uh, by showing these kind of maps or informations uh, under here, uh, fishermen can share the uh, situations about the catch, their fishing operations and resource estimation, resource estimation can show uh, the uh, change of the, uh, uh, how can I say, um, efficiency of the uh, catchment. So as you see here, the important thing is fishermen can realize how the uh, conservation of resources is important, how much it is important, and they can control, they can manage the total amount of catch by sharing information with uh, the groups of the uh, sea cucumber capture fishery. Uh, we also apply our system to the bottom trolling fishing, uh, fishing from uh, 2015 and until now. And uh, you see, this is a, a typical fishing uh, sip for the bottom trolling fishing. And because uh, the bottom trolling fishing is a little bit far from the land and the telecommunication is not so much suitable. So we have applied the Iridium satellite communication to send the data uh, to translate the, uh, transmit the data from uh, SIP to uh, international uh, uh, database server in the internet immediately. This is one of the results uh, showing the uh, density of capture fishery in, in the uh, 
for I think it is for one year in in 2015 by showing this kind of uh, maps that the fishermen can share with their uh, activities and also control and manage the resource uh, resource conservations. The uh, next uh, example is fish finder visualiz visualization. We collaborated with one of the private company in which the uh, fish finder, uh, the, they are the maker of the fish finder and fish finder company created, uh, de uh, developed this kind of floater equipped with the fish finder on the top of here. And of course it is connecting to the internet by telecommunication system, then we, collect data uh, from here to the database server. Those are the pictures of uh, real operations in SetNet fishery. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the uh, typical uh, echo sound visualization. And as you see here, uh, there are so many echoes of the fish. Actually, this is the uh, yellow t uh, yellowfin tuna and uh, by showing, by uh, looking at these kind of echoes in, in gl on ground, the fishermen can decide when do they go to the fishery or when do they, uh, how much do they, they can expect to uh, for the harvest. Now let me talk about ongoing international collaborative research with Indonesia and our university and our uh, in Japan. Uh, that, that project is called Satleps and uh, super, uh, founded by the Japanese, uh, Japan Science and Technology Agency and the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Education of Japan and also Japan uh, International Collaborate Agency under the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Japan. Uh, the uh, principal investigator of Japan side is Professor Wada uh, and the uh, counter partner of the Indonesian side is Dr. Hatim, uh, who, is, uh, belongs to, uh, who belongs to Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries KKP. And uh, the, this project is starting from, I was starting uh, from 2016 and the research period is five years, but uh, this kind of uh, the COVID-19 COVID-19 COVID uh, pandemic situation, uh, we, ex we decided to extend one more year for the research period. Anyway, uh, the project is called, uh, the title of the project is Optimizing, Optimizing Mariculture Based on Big Data with Decision Support System. Mariculture is nothing but uh, aquaculture uh, limited only in the marine. And uh, this picture is showing kind of uh, uh, fish aquaculture uh, conducted in Bali Island. This picture is showing an uh, illustration of the Satleps project in Indonesia. We have uh, five different target areas for the study and one is Lampung and the study uh, target is red tide occurrence. And uh, in Baniwaki on uh, the west coast, uh, east coast of Java Island and the uh, Planchak on southeast, south, uh, southwest Bali Island are the capture fishery about the uh, sardine, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and the gondol in Bali Island, uh, it is fish culture and the Lombok, it is seaweed culture. And those are the illustration of our research activities in uh, under this uh, Satellabs project. Let me talk about the uh, red tide in Lampung Bay, Smatola Island. And the red tide has frequently occurred since 2012. And because of the chronic uh, water pollution in Lampung Bay, and uh, that's gonna be caused a uh, rapid decline of facilities of mariculture. Uh, for example, in 2010, uh, the the numbers of facility was 150, but it's decreased up to uh, 226 on uh, 2018. As you see the picture here, that is a picture of the red tide. And also this one is the red tide too. We set up the sensors, which was developed in, the, uh, in our previous research on uh, the facilities in uh, Lampung Bay. Uh, this is kind of, uh, this is the uh, 
uh, BBPBL, I forget the exact name, but it's the kind of institutions under the uh, under Kakape, and this, this facility belongs to this uh, institution. We set up weather sensor, current meter, and water quality, including uh, chlorophyll, DO, uh, salinity, turbidity, and something like uh, something like this. And also, this is this picture is showing the uh, how can I say device for uh, sensors. I would like to show some of the uh, example about the result. And this is uh, the picture of uh, flow simulation showing the mean water transport rate. What well, uh, mean water translate, transport rate means water exchange rate. So yellow color is very uh, frequently water is exchanged, but uh, you see here, uh, the dark color is showing the low water exchange rate that is chronically, uh, chronic uh, water pollution can be uh, observed. And also this one is GIS, the result of GIS analysis showing the water uh, disabour and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, those are the agriculture field uh, with very steep uh, slope. And if uh, there is this steep slope means if once you have a heavy rain, then water erosion occurred and also soil runoff, uh, soil erosion occurred and soil runoff uh, uh, occurred and flow in th those uh, flow into the bay. And also the fertilizers used in or chemicals used in the agriculture also flow into the sea. Then that's going to be uh, how can I say that's going to be a uh, yield uh, kind of uh, eutrophication and eutrophication causes the lead tide. That is a mechanism of the lead tide in Lampun. We are intending to uh, set up kind of uh, uh, models of machine learning to identify or to uh, forecast when the lead tide is occurred, but it is still under, uh, under research. The next one is, next topic is the seaweed aquaculture in Lombok. Uh, as you know that the uh, seaweed aquaculture is also very important in, in, in the fishery industry of your country. Uh, half of the production of uh, aqu aquaculture is seaweed. And this is the typical pictures of seaweed uh, cultivation in uh, Lombok. I also, we also conducted kind of a research about the uh, uh, seaweed aquaculture in Lombok. And this is one of the results showing the visualization of suitability of cropping in a uh, uh, target area. The uh, <clears throat> target variable of this picture is the productivity and the other independent variables combining with the uh, seawater temperature, the uh, water depth, seasons and species and something like this are combined into kind of uh, index. Uh, it is called suitability index and visualized in the map like this. The red uh, dark area is suitable for uh, the cultivation and the uh, 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 sorry, uh, dark area is very active about the cultivation and uh, light area is not so much. The next uh, example of the collaborative research is uh, the capture fishery in Bali Strait. As you see in this picture, that there is a two different uh, area, uh, target area of our research field. And uh, this is typical uh, fishing vessel uh, for the sardine uh, capture fishery. And, but uh, actually the ship doesn't equip with any kind of GPS. So we set up the application for iPhone and we deliver, uh, not deliver, but uh, we borrow kind of uh, uh, application with iPhone to some uh, fishermen to, for that, so that they can collect the uh, fishing uh, location data using the iPhone's uh, GPS receiver, and also uh, the input of the information about the fishing operation. Uh, that those are the, the idea is very uh, similar with our previous research. 
This is one of the results in 2000, uh, uh, September in 2019. As you see, those dots are showing the location for uh, the capture fishery operation. And those are showing the uh, efficiency of the capture fishery too. Now we are collect, uh, continuously taking the data and show some of the uh, resource management uh, resource uh, estimation uh, so that the fisherman can conserve the uh, uh, resource of the uh, sardine. The last one is the group uh, aquaculture in Bali. As you see in here, the aquaculture in uh, fish aquaculture in Bali Island is almost uh, success, successful, com, uh, successfully conducted, and many uh, it can be expected to be a very good imp, uh, gives a very good impact to the local economy. Uh, this picture is showing the uh, kind of a glupa. Mm -hmm. The problem of the glupa aquaculture in Bali is mass mortality. As you see here, the, uh, this is showing the uh, cumulative mortality, uh, mortality of fish and uh, many of the fish died because of the rapid change of the environment. So we would like to know uh, what is the factors to give the impact for um, mortality of uh, fish in aquaculture in Go uh, Gondo. We set up sensors. We also set up kind of uh, developed kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, data collection application for iPad and I, uh, iPhone. And those are still ongoing, but uh, anyway, uh, we are still doing some of the research in global aquaculture in Bali. So I think I don't have so much time, but uh, those are remarks of my research. Uh, the, I, we believe that the smart officially uh, can uh, contribute to the increased production, information sharing, monitoring of the environment, and also business management. And we believe that the database is very important for the uh, sharing inter intellectual property, and it, is, it can be uh, contribute to the setup of policy guidelines and, of course, SDGs. So thank you very much for your attention and we are welcome to, uh, uh, we welcome international collaboration research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hatanaka. It is very, uh, it's very informative uh, that the research also collaborates uh, together while doing the research, we collaborate also as a uh, university to university. So uh, uh, before we proceed to our second, uh, to our third speaker, we have video showcase uh, from uh, Seamo Serka. Please uh, to uh, open the video uh, from uh, Seamo Serka.
Thank you very much for the video from our close partner, Samuel Serka. And now we are moving to the third speaker from ANU and Australia National University. Uh, ANU is one of the best university in the world and number one in Australia. Please allow me this time to read uh, Professor Sally Wheeler and Miss Del Druen a biography. Professor Sally Wheeler is a pro vice chancellor for international strategy and dean of ANU a College of Law of Law. Prior to taking up these positions at ANU, in 2017, Sally was pro vice chancellor for research and uh, enterprise in uh, Queen's University, Belfast. Professor Sally was the head of School uh, of Law at Queen University, Belfast for several years, where she also served as interim dean of the faculty of humanities and social sciences. In 2017 as well, Sally was awarded uh, OBE, Outcome-Based Education for Services to Higher Education in Northern Ireland. Ms. Del Druen, uh, Australian National University, is a Deputy Manager of the International Stakeholder Development at the Australian National University. So we are uh, cordially inviting Professor Wheeler for the presentation entitled Student Internship and Fellowship Future Research Talent. To Professor Wheeler, the time is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm very grateful to you uh, for the invitation, and I'd particularly like to uh, to thank uh, Professor Arif uh, Satri uh, for my invitation and to say hello to all the other speakers and uh, to IBP staff and, and students. Uh, good afternoon from Australia. Um, uh, Dadruan is going to do my slides for me as we progress through. So if you could put my first slide up, Dale, that would, uh, that would be great. Can you see that? Yeah, you could put it on full screen. That would be grand. Yes. Yes, it's great. Okay. okay. Um, so we, um, we value uh, at ANU international uh, partnerships. Um, we have during this time of, of COVID shutdown where we've simply not been able to travel at all, uh, we've been exploring innovative uh, ways to be able to maintain our existing partnerships and, uh, and source, uh, source new partnerships and, and to keep those going. Indonesia is particularly uh, important to us in Australia. Uh, it's one of our closest neighbours. It's a very fast growing economy. And I think if you look at uh, things like um, the QS rankings, we can see that Indonesian institutions are moving up those rankings very quickly. Um, when we recognize that there is a lot of uh, research talent and potential uh, collaboration uh, for ANU in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, uh, one of the ways in which we try and facilitate uh, international partnerships is through staff uh, and student mobility. And I'll give some examples uh, as I talk today. I'll, I'll talk about how important they are. Um, a method of connecting uh, Australia to, um, to the rest of the world. Um, could I have my next slide, please? Uh, OK, so I'm going to just give you some background about the Australian uh, National University. It is quite different from any other university uh, in Australia. Um, it is indeed the number one ranking university uh, in Australia. Um, it was founded in 1946, so it's not as old as many of the institutions uh, in the rest of the world and certainly not the oldest university um, in Australia by any means. But what is distinctive is that that foundation in 1946 was by the Australian federal government. So it is the only university in Australia that is funded by the Australian government. Every other university in Australia is state-based funded, whereas the national university was created after World War II with a national mission. And its mission was to look out of Australia out of Australia towards Asia, and to bring uh, Australia to the world 
uh, and the world to Australia. So that is our founding mission. It's a founding mission that we take um, very seriously and we are funded by the Australian government to do that and to focus on research that is of national importance to Australia. So if, we, if I think about the things that we concentrate on in research at the moment, um, they are things like space, space and space exploration, space medicine, space transport, uh, space minerals are very important to Australia, as is cyber, um, as is uh, artificial intelligence, defence, strategic studies. Um, we also have real strengths in the humanities, social sciences, um, languages, the studies of the study of culture as well. But it is all of our subjects are related to what makes Australia important as a state and what we can take to the world. Um, in fact, we are the only university in the world that has a Nobel laureate as our um, vice chancellor. Uh, Professor Brian Schmidt uh, was a 2011 uh, Nobel laureate in um, astrophysics. Uh, and I think that that um, sums up uh, everything about uh, ANU. Um, so if you could give me, um, and, and the, the names that I have on that slide there, they are all uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates uh, that have come through the ANU. So medicine, uh, psychology, economics, things that are of national importance to Australia as, uh, as, as a state. Um, so we are uh, located in, um, in Australia's uh, capital, um, which, unlike Jakarta, is Australia's smallest city. Um, it is nothing like, uh, nothing like your capital at all. It is a small planned city inland, um, about two and a half hours uh, from, from the coast. Um, we're also a relatively small university. Um, we have around 22,000 students with um, a slight, uh, bias towards more postgraduates than, uh, than undergraduates. Um, and again, they're congregated in areas that are of national interest to, uh, to, to Australia. Um, if, you could, if I could have my next slide. Uh, so um, one of the things that we try and work on in uh, ANU is the idea of Wicked Problems Grand Challenges. Um, so quite a lot of the things that we fund as an institution don't fit easily into particular disciplines. So, uh, for example, um, we're very interested in, in water features, we're very interested in uh, green energy, we're interested in hydrogen, things that are not naturally physics, chemistry, astrophysics or, or social sciences. We, we try and look at those problems um, through a large lens and come up with, uh, with applied, um, applied solutions. Um, you'll see there that I have uh, a slide up about the Indonesia project uh, travel grants. So the Indonesia uh, project is something that has been running um, for uh, 10 years or more at uh, ANU. Um, we like to think of ourselves as being a leading um, center for research on Indonesia, outside Indonesia. It's funded by the Australian government. Um, you'll see there that we have particular uh, themes um, and there are a series of uh, research grants there to stimulate cooperation between um, Indonesia and Australia institutes. Uh, we also have um, something called the KIS projects. Uh, that's 11 projects looking at issues across Indonesia, funded by the Australian government um, through uh, what we call uh, DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and, and Trade. And I'm sure there are some people on this call, uh, on this webinar, who will have been uh, funded through that or will have, will have come across that. Can I have my next slide, please? Um, so what we try uh, uh, and, and do with our partners is to attract 
the best um, researchers from around the world to spend a period of time uh, in Australia, um, regardless of, uh, of whether their institutions can, can afford that or not. We look to use the various government schemes that we have access to, to, um, to bring them to, uh, to Australia. Um, you'll see there I've put up something called the Future Research uh, Talent Awards. Um, this is available for um, staff and students in Indonesia, selected institutions in Indonesia. Now, Dale, you worked on this while you were part of the College of Science. Do you want to talk about this scheme? Yeah, so um, I've actually engaged with IPB um, for a number of months now, over 12 months on this scheme. Um, it's a new scheme that the College of Science and the College of Health and Medicine um, have introduced. And essentially, we selected institutions in Indonesia that we wanted to create um, research connections with. Uh, essentially, we, we already do a bit of research uh, collaboration with Indonesian institutions. Um, we, we have strong connections to ITB and um, UGM and um, UI. But one thing we did see is that we don't have enough of a connection with IPB and we would like to. So we selected IPB because IPB is, is very well renowned for environmental science and for agriculture. Um, and so essentially we ran this competitive program uh, with IPB and a range of other Indonesian universities. And we selected the best young and up and coming researchers that we can really uh, start to build those connections with. And so uh, you can see there that the 2020 recipient is Miss Judith Vega, which um, uh, Pak Satria mentioned earlier in the presentation. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, but uh, we're very happy to, to welcome uh, Miss Vega to ANU to do some collaborative research with us at the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. So that will largely be about science communication um, and the research we do, particularly in uh, environmental science and the communication around environmental science. So we're very happy to welcome Ms. Vega. Obviously, uh, COVID has put up some barriers for us in, in welcoming Ms. Vega. We had hoped to have Ms. Vega arriving now, um, but uh, this has been postponed to May to June 2021. Um, the, the other thing I would just say about the Future Research Talent Awards program is that this is the first time we've ever done this with Indonesia. We did pilot this program last year with some of the best institutions in India and it was highly successful and all of our researchers were very supportive of continuing this program but also expanding the program um, to Indonesia. So this is the first year that we really opened up to Indonesia and we were incredibly um, impressed with the applications that we received um, and all of our, our researchers from a variety of, of departments were incredibly impressed. So um, we are looking forward to welcome, welcoming Ms. Vega and we hope that the FRT program or the Future Research Talent program continues. Uh, we hope that this will continue next year and we will have some more recipients from IPB, but both staff and students. And we hope to bring them uh, and connect them with some of our, our leading researchers at ANU and that that will really start the relationship with IPB and really, um, I guess, instill that, that research connection that we're looking for. So that, that's it. Thank you, um, Professor Willer. So if I can add to that, the, the program that we ran in India before this brought 50 Indian uh, rising talent scholars to ANU. Um, and we would like to think that once borders are open, we can run a scheme of similar scale and size within Indonesia. Um, and from what we've seen so far, um, there is certainly um, way more talent than, than we have places. So we hope to be able to get funding to, to expand this. Um, uh, do, do we want to move on and show this video, Dale? Do we have time? I think we do. Uh, yes, looks like we've got time. Um, so this is just a video of the FRT program, um, just to give everybody who is not aware of the program a sense of, of the kind of experience that some of these scholars will have at ANU. Uh, this program was taken of some of our Indian students that came last year. Uh, so we will have a new video once we welcome all of our Indonesian scholars.
Yeah, you know, I couldn't hear the sound. Yeah, we're not getting any sound. Uh... Oh, no sound. Okay. Um, uh, uh, could you include uh, computer sound inside uh, the Zoom? There are some choices to put uh, the computer science inside. Computer sounds uh, inside the PDF. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. I think I found it. Just let me know if you can hear this. The Fardy Scholarship basically it provides you with financial support to go to Australia and do a research project for a span of 12 weeks in one of the finest labs that Australia has to offer. You get to do research uh, at one of the top world's universities. It provides us with the opportunity to see how labs work abroad, which will be different from the summer internships we have had here in India. To be in a whole new environment for a period of three months is like super exciting for me. Living in a completely different country is a very good experience to have. It's a life-changing opportunity. I mean, those three months, I would say a golden period of my life where I learned a lot of things and I see, I bring a lot of change in me. I would surely recommend this program and I would urge my friends back to apply for this program because there's a lot to learn about research and apart from research. So that really just gives you a sense of what the FRT program is and what the experience of some of these Indian scholars were. So we really hope that uh, when we do welcome all of our Indonesian scholars that, that they will have a similar experience and we really hope to continue this program moving forward. Um, Dale, there's a, a question come through on the question board about the Talent Award being open to students from other Indonesian universities beside the ones you listed. Yeah, so it is open to other institutions, but um, we do actually invite institutions uh, to be part of the program. We did have approximately uh, 30 institutions across Indonesia that participated in this. And the institutions were largely selected based on um, either existing um, areas of research that align with ANU research or um, existing research collaborations that we were really hoping to support. Um, but if you um, have a look at the, uh, we will share the presentation at the end of this, and there is a link there with more information. So you can actually send an inquiry di directly to the FRT team um, if you are not from one of the participating institutions. Um, I would also say that in addition to the FRT scheme, um, there are um, regular uh, opportunities to apply for visiting wards across ANU. So I, my other role is Dean of the College of Law. We have a visitor scheme there. We also have um, uh, scholarships available for our um, master's degree uh, in, in law and they're available to students from particular Indonesian uh, institutions. And we're open to taking uh, on board more institutions. Um, certainly the Crawford School of Public Policy uh, in the College of Asia and Pacific has a number of visiting uh, opportunities. Before COVID um, hit the world, we were about to launch um, some visiting policy fellowships where we were open to uh, inviting scholars uh, from across the world, but with a particular focus on our near neighbors in, in Asia, Indonesia being prime uh, among those. Uh, to actually come to ANU for a period of time uh, and, and to produce uh, some outputs. Um, we are very, very keen to uh, learn from people in the area, um, uh, but also uh, we're very keen to engage uh, in, thing, in capacity building activities um, around PhD supervision, joint PhD supervision, building of online teaching resources, and also entering into jo joint and or dual degrees uh, or, or grad certs, particularly at the postgraduate level. We would look at the undergraduate level, but we're particularly keen on harnessing postgraduate talent. Um, and certainly for our vice chancellor, he is very keen that people of talent get to experience one of the world's greatest universities 
irrespective of financial status. So we do try to put quite generous scholarships and uh, financial provision around what we do. And we're looking really to build research collaboration around our key areas. So we'd be very keen um, to hear from, uh, from people who, uh, who want to engage in that with us. There's Australian government money, but there's also um, other pools of national funding. Uh, so please do contact us. And we're quite happy to, uh, Dan and I, to, to take any more questions uh, that there might be, or indeed for you to contact us by email um, afterwards. Um, so Dale, can you just put up that final slide for me? Or um, Yeah. Uh, so um, we're also uh, the Australian university that has the biggest language capacity as well. So we're also looking always to, to build on that and to build on the work that we do in, uh, in, in cultures. Um, and I might just add to that, that I'm actually an ANU alum from the Indonesian language program. So I'm very happy to be engaging with our Indonesian colleagues. Um, and maybe we can we can have a conversation at the end of this <laughs> to, to remind me of my studies. <laughs> so I think that, that, that concludes our uh, scripted contribution. But as I say, we're very happy to take questions. Uh, and thank you very much again for your invitation and for your time. Thank you very much to all esteemed speaker. Now uh, we believe that there are, there are many questions uh, coming also in the uh, Q and A in chat, and uh, now we are opening the Q and A sessions. Uh, please uh, try also to open your Zoom and YouTube chat box. Uh, the Q and A sessions. The first questions coming uh, to uh, Professor uh, Dodi first. Uh, so it's about the IPB strategy. What is IPB strategy to strengthen the engagement uh, with international partner? So that's the first uh, questions to uh, Professor Dodi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Dasau Navi. Yeah, uh, we have uh, several programs uh, to increase uh, the engagement of the international uh, partners. Uh, first, uh, we... Uh, it is uh, uh, the uh, third years we conduct uh, international summer course. And in the uh, international summer course, we involve uh, not only partic international participants, 50% uh, of the participants uh, should be international participants. And we uh, give uh, a small, uh, not scholarship, but uh, uh, funding for accommodation yeah, for international uh, participants usually. Uh, about uh, 20 uh, par uh, international participants per uh, summer course. So we conduct about uh, 20 summer course each year. And uh, each summer course usually uh, have uh, 40 participants. And 50% of the 40 participants uh, usually is uh, usually uh, uh, international uh, participants. This uh, first one. And the second one, the tutor of our summer course also from uh, international tutor, yeah. Uh, for, for each uh, uh, summer course, we invite uh, two international uh, tutor. Could be uh, from uh, partners universities, yeah. Uh, we do hope that uh, in this year we can also involve uh, ANU and also uh, Tokyo University of Agriculture or Kasachan University and other partners uh, for uh, also to participate in uh, our international summer courses. And, and then uh, we also conduct an uh, international uh, conference yeah, uh, funded by IPB University. And in the international conference, uh, we uh, invite uh, uh, keynote speakers from uh, international partners, yeah, two or three uh, international uh, keynote uh, speakers. And then uh, starting this year, yeah, we uh, make a new program, namely uh, a joint lecture, yeah, joint lecture. So uh, we conduct a lecture uh, together with international partners. And we do hope uh, in the normal uh, era after the pandemic, if we already uh, uh, make uh, offline courses, yeah, normal courses, 
uh, we still uh, have a online program like a joint uh, lecture. I mean, that is a, like a parallel class, for example, at IPB, class at IPB, parallel with class at uh, NU or, or TUA, for example. So we, uh, the students can uh, was this, uh, uh, feel yeah, uh, the, was this, the situation of uh, the class in NU or in uh, Tokyo University of Agriculture yeah, uh, in the real situation. So class to class, it's like a, 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 a parallel uh, teaching, but uh, not only online, but it's like a blended uh, uh, system. Yeah? So we have a class Uh, at IPB, but uh, students in uh, NU and in uh, TUA maybe can relay our class, and vice versa. We can also uh, can relay a class uh, uh, from NU or from TUA or from other partner university. We start already with uh, Melbourne, yeah, Melbourne and Monash, yeah, Pak Dasar, yeah, uh, yeah, last month, yeah. And uh, uh, with uh, some colleagues uh, from USA also from Dartmouth College, yeah, uh, about two months ago we already uh, conducted a, a joint uh, lecture. So uh, this uh, uh, part of our uh, uh, efforts, yeah, to increase uh, international collaboration. And also uh, we also uh, give a, a, what's this? A, Uh, scholarships, yeah, uh, not 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 from IPB, but uh, from KNP, for example, Kementerian Negara Berkembang, yeah, uh, for developing countries, yeah, to uh, study at IPB, and also uh, we make a collaboration with, for example, the AD uh, for Timor Leste students, yeah, to study at IPB, yeah. So it is also uh, one of uh, the important efforts yeah, to increase internationalization at IPB University. Thank you very much, Pak Dasar. Thank you very much, Professor Dodi. So it is also welcome during uh, the pandemic, but uh, there are some information about online uh, international seminar and online also summer course that I IPB uh, will uh, open for uh, this year, 2020. Uh, and there are questions to uh, uh, Professor Hatanaka that will be uh, represented by Professor Safia Ramadona. Uh, the first is how Japan maximize narrow sea uh, territories. That's the first question uh, from uh, Subhani Aden. And then the second question is from Sobrina Silmi. Uh, in Japanese fisheries, is there any regulations dealing with the limited number of fish species that should be caught by the fishermen? So there, there are uh, two questions coming from the attendees. Please, uh, Professor Sapia Ramadona. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, uh, I think the answer could be a very detailed one, <laughs> but we are not going to talk about that kind of very detailed stuff right here, right? Okay. So put it simple. Um, Japan, how Japan maximizes Narosi territories? Um, well, in Japan, Um, mainly the local fishery is uh, controlled by local government and also by um, fishery associ associative. So there's an association of um, um, fishermen and also local government. Um, and how can you maximize the narrow sea? Actually, Japan's uh, sea territories is quite big. It's the fifth in the world, I, fifth or sixth, or I forgot. The ZEE is fifth or sixth in the world, so it's quite big actually. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure how how you can say that it's um, kind of narrow, but it's kind of big actually. And because of that regulation, um, the fishermen also follow the regulation because if they don't follow, it will be like causing that. Um, a damage to the environment as well, so because they are aware of that one as well. Uh, is it okay, or should I talk more detail about that? I think I don't, right? <laughs> okay, thank you for, very much for uh, the answer. So, uh, uh, for the next question, um, is there any regulation dealing with the limited number of fish? Yes, there is. There is a uh, several regulation of that. I think. The fisheries people should be aware of TAC, total allowable catch, 
that's mm. also there is also that kind of regulation in Japan. However, not all of these spaces are um, included in TAC regulation. For example, what Hatanaka Sensei mentioned, um, uh, the professor Hatanaka, Hatanaka mentioned about the sea cucumber, mm -hmm. it was not um, in the TAC regulation, but after uh, we conducted this uh, research uh, that briefly explained by professor Hatanaka, um, the government is starting to consider it to putting it uh, the sea cucumber in the TAC regulation. Thank you. More or less, it's the same with some other countries. Okay. So now uh, there is a limited number also later, perhaps for the sea uh, cucumber. Okay. Uh, next, uh, still the questions in regard to uh, the uh, program, although it has already answered by uh, Ms. Uh, Del Druen, but uh, we want to know again about the uh, future research talent. Is it open for all, uh, again, uh, Indonesian university or only for specific institutions? I, I can answer that one. Um, so it is only open to selected institutions that we approach. Um, mm. However, we're very open to considering institutions um, if they do uh, research in areas that align with our um, research strengths at ANU and our research interests. And we are also open to um, accepting institutions if there are pre-existing research collaborations as well. But what, what we can do is we will share the information at the end of this presentation with the link on the PowerPoint presentation to the uh, FRT page and um, inquiries can be submitted through that page um, and an expression of interest can be submitted. Okay. Thank you uh, for uh, the answer. Uh, there are some other questions uh, from uh, Umar uh, Haliwanda uh, asking, is there any other collaborations with other university instead of that uh, I have already mentioned? For example, is there any collaborations with the university in Indonesia, but in Sumatra area? For example, the Sahkuala University, uh, that uh, collaborate with ANU? So let me let you into a terrible secret. ANU has over 700 partners around the world, um, but we probably only centrally hold details of about 400 of those. So ANU schools and colleges have rafts of collaborations that um, that we don't necessarily have any visibility of. So I imagine that in our College of Asia and Pacific, there will be a collaboration with that university um, because Indonesia and collaboration with Indonesia is very important to our schools and colleges. So there might not be anything in the sciences, but there may very well be more generally with the university around public policy, social science, etc. So uh, thank you for uh, the answer. Is wait, uh, there are some other questions uh, for uh, for uh, a for uh, still for, for Professor uh, Wheeler. Uh, what uh, should we prepare, uh, for example, when we want to apply for a student internship or fellowship in Australian National University? Because uh, what uh, we heard that ANU is very uh, very strict in regard to, uh, for example, IELTS and uh, something like that. Is there any, uh, like, for example, for Indonesian uh, students or Indonesian researchers to reduce uh, the uh, IELTS score? For so our IELTS score is generally 6.5, um, which is around about the, uh, the, the standard that, I mean, all universities take on uh, 6.5. My experience of Indonesian students is they always say to you that their English isn't very good, but actually as soon as they start speaking, it's great. Um, so I, I honestly, I don't think IELTS is the hurdle that, that you think it is. Whenever I've done teaching in Indonesia, we always have this. They don't want to ask questions in English um, because they say their English isn't good enough, but actually, once they start talking, their English is great. 
And what are other uh, than uh, English, uh, what uh, they should be prepared in order to get successful in the internship or fellowship uh, at ANU? I, I, I think more important is to really focus on what you want to do at the Australian National University. So rather than just write a general query, actually come to us with a proposal about what you want to do and, and who you want to collaborate with and where in the, where in the university you want to be. Um, and that really helps us see if there is an opportunity for you. We get a lot of letters, a lot of email requests from people just generally wanting to come. It's much easier if you tell us what it is you want to do, where you want to be, if you want to work with a particular person or be in a particular department, we're in a much better position to help you. Uh, okay. Thank you for uh, the tips uh, for getting the internship or fellowship in ANU. And uh, the next still, there are some questions in regard asking uh, for uh, the uh, to uh, Professor Safi, for example, they ask about the cultural differences uh, in Japan. Uh, being, uh, how can we, uh, for example, as Indonesian, uh, that can understanding the cultural differences in Japan when we want, uh, for example, to study or continue the research in a Japanese university. Okay, thank you. That's a very interesting question. Actually, well, because I'm Indonesian myself, I happen to be Indonesian. And I've been living in Japan for 13 years. So in the first several, I think, months or years, I also experienced some kind of um, cultural differences because I was born in Indonesia and I grew up in Indonesia mm -hmm. and then went to Japan. Mm -hmm. um, to face that kind of phenomena, I think it's better if you have a lot of Japanese friends. Of course, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of local Japanese friends and also try to study Japanese so you can understand it better. <laughs> I think that's um, one of, uh, two, two of the most um, simple ways mm -hmm. to, to, to face a cultural difference between um, mm -hmm. Indonesia and Japan. And because I happen to be a Muslim myself, um, what I was struggling was pray and also the food mm -hmm. because we need to eat halal food and we need to pray five times a day so sometimes it is quite difficult in the beginning but well when you spend like several months you will understand how to do a proper um, way how to pray like outside of your classes or somewhere in the um, the place that nobody was around and for the food well you've got to find <laughs> the food that is not containers of pork or alcohol but now we have smartphones we have google translate if you don't understand japanese if you don't read japanese for example when i was in the first year of my uh, study in 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 japan uh, reading Japanese is a must for me because I need to read the ingredients of the food mm. uh, so that I can see whether there is a pork or alcohol in it or not. But now you have Google Translate, you can just use this phone to scan and translate whether it's containing of pork or not. So I think it's getting easier today. Thank you. Friend. And uh, I think the, the questions coming from uh, the students as well. Uh, to uh, both uh, Professor Wheeler and also Professor Safir, uh, what should be in my research proposal that can make my research uh, proposal eye-catching and acceptable uh, either in uh, Australian and also in Australian University or Australian National University or in uh, Tokyo uh, Agri Tokyo uh, Nodai, so uh, to be acceptable. So sometimes uh, there are a uh, SUD uh, university where uh, for the students graduate has to collaborate first, or we can directly send our proposal to the uh, university uh, target. So the first um, question 
this is uh, about the research proposal to be eye-catching. The second question, should when applying uh, for internship or applying for fellowships in the targeted university, the graduate in Indonesia, for example, the university in Indonesia should have collaboration first or uh, do not have the collaboration, it's also okay to accept that students. Dale, do you want to talk about the research proposal on the future talent scheme? Yeah, so I think um, what what we've seen from some of our researchers and, and what they're most interested in in proposals is seeing uh, the research experience that that the scholars have had. Um, so if students have um, already had some research experience at their institution, uh, whether they already have publications or um, you know whether they have already undertaken previous internships, that, that has really been something that's been considered in the FRT program. Um, another thing just around um, the proposal being eye-catching is just how relevant the research is um, for, for ANU as well and, and making sure that the experience of the proposed supervisor aligns with the experience of the students um, what in terms of their, their interests and their, their research topic. So I would say they, they would be the, the key things that the researchers were looking at in terms of what's eye-catching. Um, wh whether or not they already have a research collaboration, obviously it, it is helpful if they, if they have some existing collaboration, but that, that, that's not the only thing that they were looking at. They were really looking at um, what experience they might have had in Indonesia or at other institutions. Um, we also considered things like their GPA, how high their GPA was, um, how high their, their English was. So it was really kind of looking at the holistic um, experience of each of the students. Thank you very much for the uh, explanation. And uh, from Professor Sapio, perhaps a short word about the proposal to be eye-catching. Other than English skill, and the so other than English skill, I think what we have to um, like put the focus on are the feasibility of the theme. For example, you have only two months, but in the proposal, you write you can develop a vaccine of COVID nineteen. It's impossible, right? So it's feasibility of the theme during your limited time. And then second one is a very strong research plan, I think. Okay. And uh, still asking uh, from, uh, I think from Eastern part of Indonesia, asking will uh, for, uh, future research talent awards uh, to extend its spills, not only from the NU uh, College of Science? Yes. Um, when I was drafting the ANU International Strategy, which will so shortly be publicly available on our website, um, I looked at the College of Science scheme and the idea was to roll that scheme out um, across ANU. Um, yeah, I saw that as well. You are wearing batik. That's, that's <laughs> very good. Um, so the idea was that the College of Science pioneered this scheme, it was very successful, it built links, it attracted really good students, um, and other colleges wanted to do it, and we were using that as a model. Now obviously, what works in the College of Science doesn't necessarily work the same in the College of Business and Economics and the College of Law, they're not identical, but the idea is, is very similar that you pair up a student who has a project with a professor that is interested in that area um, and that they work exclusively on that for um, two or three months. And maybe they work towards a joint authored paper, maybe they work towards a, a, uh, a postdoc proposal, but that you know they have an agreed target that they're going to work towards in that area of interest. Still asking about the uh, future research talents because of this year's uh, postponing uh, due to the COVID-19. Uh, what about next year's? How many numbers of uh, students or uh, researchers that can uh, award it by the future research talents uh, from Indonesia for the next year's? 
So we're just, as a university, working on our 2021 budget. Mm -hmm. um, we do that budget through August and September. And I think by the end of that, we will have um, a better idea of what we can set aside for those, those scholarships. It also depends a little bit on whether the world is open or closed. Uh, if you'd asked me last week, I would have said, everything will be back to normal by the start of 2021. Um, a new outbreak in Australia, just in the last day or so, everything looks very different. Okay. Thank you very much for the answer. And one more question coming in uh, uh, to Tokyo Nadai. Would you please talk a bit more on Tokyo Nadai's special program for master scholarships, especially because I'm still uh, a bachelor uh, student. So for uh, the master, special master program in Tokyo Nadai. So there is a program of um scholarship from Tokyo Nodai, but it's right now limited only to uh, IPB University students or IPB University graduated student. I mean, the alumni of, Tokyo, of IPB University. If so, you have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, every year, actually Tokyo Nodai, um, uh, every year to Indonesian um, students from IPB universities are coming to Tokyo Nodai. One master student and one bachelor student. Mm -hmm. And it will continue as well. So for that one, for, for if you are applying a master course um, stuff, what you have to do is first you have to find your um, supervisor here in Tokyo Nodai. So you can just uh, do it by sending email to several professor or you can just directly asking me. Mm -hmm. I can um, uh, 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 help probably, I don't know. Perhaps we can work together. Okay. And the second one, you have to pass the test given by IPB University. Okay. So uh, there is one more question, I think still coming out from uh, the students uh, to uh, Professor Relure or uh, Ms. Dell, still about uh, FRT. Which one the most important, English, proposal, or IELTS score? Which one is more important uh, to uh, win the FRT, uh, to, be, uh, an, uh, to be an OVD of FRT, a future research talent OVD? So which one is the most uh, important, either English, uh, research proposal, or uh, which one is the most uh, important? I would say the research proposal is, is the most important one. Uh, the researchers are very keen to see the experience of the students, the research experience. Um, so of course we consider the other requirements, but research is really what we're looking at. So to the uh, to the one that asking the question, is that quite clear? Ah, okay, so there, there there are some informations on my uh, panel. Okay, so now it's almost uh, coming to uh, an end. We came uh, to the last bit of this webinar and time to wrap up of our event together. Hopefully uh, today will be beneficial for everybody and we are encouraged to engage more uh, to each uh, other despite this uneasy time of COVID-19 and keep the positive spirit alive. So uh, thank you very much to all the speaker on behalf of the committee. We would like also to say thank you for all the attention and participation through the webinar and we apologize for any mistake we have made. Lastly, we hope that this webinar will give you inspire to learn something before we retire. Therefore, we should collaborate and conspire stronger international relation and respire to fulfill our desire as our life enhancer, university networking make us better, 
our voice will be stronger, understanding among universities become higher, and university ranking become happier as well. So thank you and see you later. Thank you for uh, attention. Thank you uh, for great uh, web this webinar and stay safety, stay healthy, keep stay positivity, make you handsome and pretty. Thank you, thank you very much for all attendees and all the panelists. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Sampai you. jumpa. Sampai jumpa. Thank you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Profesor Safir. Terima kasih juga saya belum Profesor, saya masih. Doa. Ya doa, doa Mas. Amin. Thank you Profesor Wheeler. Thank you very much Profesor Wheeler and Miss Dale Durhan. It was very interesting. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih banyak untuk Ah, tampilin sambil ini. Indonesia, the world's mega diverse country. With all these gifted resources, from the land to the ocean, all these potentials inspire us to conduct research and discover high impact innovations through sustainability towards the 4.0 era. To flourish with technology. This is our moment of contribution. To our surroundings, our society, and our earth, rendering our ocean as the world's maritime hub. Exceptional in agriculture. Outstanding in bioscience for a sustainable world. IPB University, Bogor, Indonesia. We put integrity forward. is created now. I hope there will be another wedding. Itu ada juga yang dari Malaysia. Ada always been told entering university is about getting a degree graduating being employed getting rich are the typical definitions of success
that's deeply engraved in our mind. But then, is it actually that simple? How about them? about our environment. It's not only about graduating, being employed, or getting rich. It's not merely about making names for ourselves, but to become meaningful for others.